Good morning and welcome to another edition of Mastermind Minutes. My name is Gary Ocubroso. I'm the managing partner for Franchise Growth Solutions. You can learn about what we do by hitting our website from the link that is placed either above or below the webcast. For those of you joining us for the first time, Mastermind Minutes is a podcast designed to interview an expert on a topic, typically one topic. We have one question and one uh, expert answer. You can watch us on FranchiseMoneyMaker.com. You can watch us on LinkedIn and YouTube. You can listen to the podcast on Spotify, Apple, and Google. And today my guest is Mike Bausch. He's an industry leader whose restaurant, Andolini's Pizzeria, is a top 10 pizzeria in the United States, as named by TripAdvisor, BuzzFeed, CNN, uh, USA Today. Andalini's began in 2005 and has grown to five pizzerias, two gelaterias, two food hall concepts, a food truck, and a fine dining restaurant by 2019. Mike is a world pizza champion, a Guinness Book world record holder, and a writer for Pizza Today. He's part of a Marine Corps family uh, who has lived all across the United States from New York to California. Mike calls Tulsa home and lives with his wife, Michelle, and his son, Henry. And uh, Mike, before we get into the question, first of all, thank you very much for being with us today. I'm anticipating a really good conversation because I love pizza. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Bef wait, actually, before you do that, I forgot. I wanted to hold up the book. This is Mike's book, which we'll talk about. It's called Unsliced, How to Stay Whole in the Pizzeria Industry. Um, so Mike, before we get into the question, why don't you tell us about the book, tell us about yourself and what you've been doing lately. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Uh, the book is a, a book geared towards restaurant owners, business owners, obviously the pizzeria industry, which is a very, very hard industry. I mean, restauranting is hard in and of itself, but people don't expect their burger to show up in their house in like 30 minutes or less. Uh, pizza mm -hmm. takes it to another very aggressive level. People are very prideful of their pizza choices. So there's very little room for error and creating systems and making an exceptional experience isn't obvious to someone who just opened up. And in this book, I seek to take, you know, 16 years of screw ups, things I've learned, things that helped and take someone from instead of waiting 10 years to figure that stuff out, maybe get it done in a, in a 300 page read and put it into practice the next day. It's not the biography or, or my self analysis. It's not me bloviating about me. It's a real all killer, no filler. Here's how you execute. Here's how you get your mind right. And I read it and write it in a very approachable way as I speak uh, with F bombs and, and everything that I would speak to if you walked into my pizzeria, I was like, okay, this is what you're going to do. You got to make sure you have X, Y, Z. So it's a palatable read for, you know, a lot of people that don't, not that they don't read all the time, but don't have time to read. They're not probably the type of person who's stopping to have a leisurely read. The restaurant industry typically doesn't allow for that. And that's what this book is. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for using the word bloviate. I absolutely love that. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting because you said two things there. Um, that kind of trigger off the first question, you know, you mentioned about the difficulty of the, of the pizza business and the restaurant business. Uh, and then you use the word systems. So first of all, knowing uh, maybe you didn't know it then when you got into the pizza business, but if you knew how difficult it was, do you think it would have changed your mind? I mean, what inspired you to get into the business? I, it, it's weird. My, my path to owning a pizzeria is an odd one in that I was on my pathway to being a JAG lawyer in the Marine Corps, paid for by the U.S. government with a, a full ride to law school. When I went to OCS, did that training, and then came home at 135 pounds, realizing I had type 1 insulin-dependent juvenile diabetes. And I got through all of OCS. With that, I realized how far I could push my body at and my mind, but that I wasn't allowed to go back. So I had the lessons, but not the, the money from JAG. And then I go to law school day one of law school. I was like, this, this isn't for me. This isn't what I want to do for the next three years and drop another 150,000 bucks on. And my brother was transferring to 
Tulsa at the time. I was in San Francisco, grew up in the New Jersey, New York area. My parents are born and raised in Chelsea, Manhattan. And he was getting transferred as vice president of Alamo Rent-A-Car. He's 15 years older than me to Tulsa. And on a whim, I just went out there. And as much as I had been good at a lot of things and bad at a lot of things in my life uh, and swallowed a lot of crow, I, when I ever did a restaurant, I took to it immediately. I love the speed. I love the, the pace. I love creating something that people enjoyed. I like being at people's happy day, the happy part of their day. Even if it was a hard part of my day, I liked all of the hospitality industry instantly resonated with me when I did it on a lark. I worked at a nice steakhouse in, in California and I just took to it. So the thought of, okay, let's do a restaurant, not pizzeria, not anything in particular. Let's do a restaurant. And I had worked a few pizza places in high school and college, not enough to warrant the knowledge that it takes to open a pizzeria, let alone run one. And everything about this story is what you shouldn't do and why we should have failed. But on the flip side, if someone just says, I'm not going to die, I'm not going to let this fail. If you really have that just blunt determination to work 20 hours a day, not in hyperbole, but literally 20 hours a day, that you can achieve it. And that's what I was able to do was just give up all of my 20s to making this thing a reality. Wow. Wow. That's, that's a great story. So, um, you know, having been in the business a long time, um, I tell people all the time for myself, I've been in the business 35 years. I tell folks that when I started out in the restaurant business, I was six foot five and now I'm five <laughs> foot six because it does kind of beat you down a little bit. It does. Um, so m maybe a quick war story with respect to what, 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 what was your greatest challenge over the years uh, being, being in the business? Well, one of your biggest challenges. I mean, it, the first challenge I, I got was I'm 22 and just I'm hiring kids that are a few years younger than me to treat me like a boss and I acted as such but you know also starting as a family business it was we there wasn't enough okay this is the definable boundary of what should be done that was really hard in the first year you have a bunch of high school kids who want to like hang out after work and I'm saying no I have nowhere to go after work because I just moved into a town and I don't know anyone but at the same time I'm not hanging out with the high school kids and then I'm living with my brother and it's just a lot of family stuff can happen and also creating boundaries and, and setting the business up for success was really hard at first. Then it was creating systems because you think, okay, this is obvious. Anyone would know to do this, but common sense isn't common. And Murphy's law will dictate a lot of failures because if it can happen two times wrong out of a hundred, well, if it happens a hundred times a week, you're going to have two screw ups without fail per week. And that's the type of thing that will just perpetuate itself that I had to learn to undo at a very quick rate with no guidance. There's no, oh, you're opening a new restaurant. Well, here's your employee handbooks and here's your issue of uh, how you're going to deal with, you know, an employee that wants to steal. And here's how you're going to deal with this. Having great food is the price of admission. It's just, it's just your ticket in. It doesn't guarantee anything. And a lot of people will assume, well, I'm great at cooking a steak or I, I'm an amazing chef. And that's great. Stay doing that at home because all the other stuff that goes into this is what people just don't take into account. And well, it's what beat me over the head for a decade. You, you are preaching to the choir. Let me just, <laughs> let me just take a, a minute here. First of all, uh, I can't say it was my biggest challenge, but it certainly was a challenge. When I opened up my Dunkin' Donuts franchise, I was 24, and a lot of the young people that we hired were 17, 18, 19. So I kind of got that boundary piece was, was a challenge. Looking back on it, it was kind of interesting, but in that moment, it was certainly a challenge. With respect to the center of the plate, um, not being the one and only aspect of the restaurant business. Again, as I mentioned, you're preaching to the choir. I'm in the franchising business. So what I do is I come in and my partner, we come in, we look at an independent operator, an independent business, an individual that may want to franchise and duplicate that model. And it's all about duplication and, and, and systems. And for the people who know me, they know, and I give out scores and scores and scores of for free, 
of Michael Gerber's book, The E-Myth Revisited. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's mm -hmm. all about the franchise prototype, which is all about systems. And, you know, documenting those systems, the trial and the error, the bloody noses, the loss of money, the loss of sleep. That's really what it's all about. I mean, for us, very often, the, the, the individual in the process that slows the system process down is sometimes the founder of a company who may think his business is built on something that it really isn't. And then sometimes if they have a chef, that can be challenging because the chef doesn't want to hear that a 17 year old, you're going to create a system so that a 17 year old can actually duplicate that wonderful dish that they went to school to learn how to create. So it's all about, it's all about systems. So talk to me a little bit about the type of systems that you've employed that keep kind of your ship running. Cause you've got, you've got a footprint here. You've got, you know, several restaurants, you've got a food truck, you're doing a food hall, like, You've got to have some things there. Tell me about some of those systems. Well, some I, I get into in detail with a lot of specificity. And specificity is a big part of what I talk about and preach in the systems is even a pepperoni pizza. If I said it has 50 slices of pepperoni on it, some would just say, okay, 50 slices. But I get down to, okay, it's going to be 25 on the outside, then a 10 on there, then another 10, then a five in the center. And then here's a photo of it. And there you go. And to your point about not trusting 17 year olds. Yes. It's a very, very problematic thing that stops people from their next level of success is their ego ego that I created this. No one else could do it. And I say to that, we allowed 17 year olds to defeat the Nazis. I'm pretty sure they could case sausage. <laughs> Fantastic. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, so I got the book open here and I just, you know, I just want to ask you uh, just maybe if you want to just expand, there was a section in here that I truly enjoyed called confidence versus cockiness. Um, what, what can you tell us about that with respect to how it ended up in here and what it means? I, to do your own business in any way, shape or form takes a leap of faith. You have to be confident in yourself and in your ability to say, I can do this. I believe in me. I want to bet on me. But with that said, if you're cocky, you can screw it all up before you even start. So I say there's confidence, cockiness, and ego. Mm -hmm. So confidence would be like, I can do this. I will, I will put in the work and I can do this. Cockiness will be like, I'll do this and it'll be super easy and it won't be that hard and I'll be great at it. And then ego is like, I'll be the greatest person to ever do it and I haven't even started yet. And I see the second and the third pervasive in the restaurant industry, especially when people just speak negatively of other restaurants, but they haven't even tried them or they'll say, we're better. Or, I don't understand. They have no one in their restaurant, but they're deriding all the successful restaurants as being less than yeah. just like a band with no one in the crowd. Who's, who's saying, you know, that, that band with the, the line out the door, they, they suck, but we're the best. Right. You're not the best. When you can admit you're not the best and you're able to grow and the complacency of today, the happiness of today is the direct enemy of tomorrow. Wow. That's, that's great. You know, last week on the program, we had a gentleman, Stephen Kohler, who, who is a coach in, in, in kind of coaches leadership in listening skills and, you know, confidence versus cockiness, you know, confident people listen and learn. Actually, um, he, he threw me a quote that I had never heard by, by Jimi Hendrix, who I love. Um, and, and Hendrix said, knowledge speaks, wisdom listens. Mm -hmm. And I think when you look at confidence versus cockiness, cockiness is always speaking. Confidence is always listening and getting, mm -hmm. and getting better. Um, you know, the, the, the systems or the, the, the plan, because I'm a, I'm a planner, I'm very anal like that. Uh, in the book, you talk about kind of the four point basic uh, leadership plan, you know, what, what those things are. Can you, and I'll, I'll, I'll rattle them off. It's, it's, it's access your resources, develop a plan, communicate effectively and execute. Can you expand a little bit on those and on the actual leadership plan that you speak of here? Yeah, any, 
anything that you want to create is a lot easier when it's definable or when you define it akin to gravity did apples not fall off trees until sir isaac newton made the law of gravity of course not but when he defined it it's like okay that's the law of gravity well this is the law of creating a plan you assess your resources and surroundings what do i have at my disposal who is available what can i do then okay develop a plan and then communicate it communicate it effectively and then assess and the resource of did that communication land if not start to plan over for anything for if it's the most massive thing imaginable to the most small to the smallest thing what do i have at my disposal i have capital i have builders i don't have them okay great then i need to get capital or i need to get builders breaking it down but it's very definable and every time i run into an issue it goes back to that even if it's i have staff that is given tasks before they're supposed to leave for the night and they don't do those tasks. Okay, so I have, a, I have a staff, that's my resources, but the communication didn't land when we said, okay, sweet, before you leave. Why did it not land? Okay, let's go back and what would happen if I needed them to do this or else someone was gonna die? If I think about it in terms of life or death, which is way dramatic and overthrown, but if you really think of it in terms of that, then you could get somewhere. So I would need to, say okay you need to sweep that corner it's 8 30 now when could you do it by i could do it in the next 15 minutes okay very good when you do it come get me and i will verify that it was done or i'm about to leave i need you to take a photo of it and text it to me that it was done to get to that level of specificity and verification you would ensure that there's no way it couldn't get done on this microscopic level all the way up to let's do a new restaurant what do we have at our disposal well we have a kitchen we have people we have money okay great we're going to communicate this to this person this to this person this to this person go back to the start verify the communication and grow well well said well said i mean on the execution side as you point out i mean i i'm, I'm one of those people who believe that knowledge is not power it's the execution of knowledge that's power um, that's true you know there's a there's a lot of people out there with a lot of great ideas and you know uh an entrepreneur goes from an idea to action and a wantrepreneur, as I say, goes from idea to idea to idea and never yes. actually executes on anything. Um, your publicist gave me a bit of information because when I spoke, when she and I spoke, you know, she knows I'm a musician. So uh, I gather perhaps maybe you have some connection because one of the things she wanted me to ask you about was why music is such an important factor in how you run your business. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, it's I love, I mean, I, just like any person with a soul, I love music, but the, uh, and it's interesting, the status of music in the modern world, like music really hasn't used to be at a, at a lightning pace, the way technology right now is at a lightning pace where a new earth shattering band was coming out every year. We really haven't had that for the last 20 years. Yep. You know, if the, the, a band that would headline now probably could have been on the billboards in 2005, 2006. If you were to say in 1969 that Woodstock was going to be headlined by Buddy Holly, that would be a kind of crazy st statement. But uh, when it comes to music, I have musical interludes between each chapter to set up the next chapter. And I have it as a Spotify playlist on my website. And I just believe that a restaurant is an experience. A lot of people, especially pizza guys, pizza guys, when they're not ops guys, but they're bakers, and it's a beautiful thing, but they become so in love with the baking process, which you need to be, but they completely disassociate from the service and the ambiance, mm -hmm. which are just as important as the food. Absolutely. Even more so because great service can, can fix bad food. Great food can't fix bad service. So going to that level and creating an ambiance of the book and a unique selling point and little hidden things in a book, just like I do in my restaurant, taking that same ethos from the ambiance of my restaurant to the ambiance of the book was important for me. And that's why I added uh, musical interludes. And it's interesting. I couldn't just quote uh, a song quote because that's intellectual property. So I had to reference the backstory of a song and then just say, here's the title to it Yeah. without giving any of the lyrics. It's a very interesting thing of what you're allowed to do and not do in a book. So originally I started with quotes and then I went into the whole backstory on uh tomorrow never knows which is the last song in the book by the beatles uh 
from Revolver. Yeah, I found, you know, I, I agree. And, you know, I think, um, you know, how we weave things together and how we keep people engaged in the communication process is as important as the information we're attempting to communicate. And when I look at the restaurant business, and I, I couldn't agree with you more, how we create an overall experience for the guest while they're in our restaurant is as important as the food. If the, if the service is great, the food is better. Um, and as you said, you know, great food will not overcome bad service. It's interesting because in the franchising business, we, we sometimes will say that we would prefer to have an A plus owner in a B plus location than a B plus owner in an A plus location. Yeah. Uh, yes. you don't, you don't maximize and you don't optimize what's there. Well, this has been like incredibly interesting. Is there any last thoughts you want to leave with us for someone who might want to get into the, uh, into the, the pizza business? And then I'll ask you um, how people can get in touch with you if they'd like. If, if someone's a casual, if you're casually thinking about getting into this, I, the first two chapters of my book are, I believe, a necessary read. And if you read it and you're like, that was worthless, tell me, I will find a way to refund you because I guarantee you it won't be a worthless effort. If you just remotely have this small little skosh of a thought about entering the restaurant industry, the first two chapters really dissect and ask you the question, is this something you need? Because if it's something you want, do not do it. If it's something you need, if it's in your lifeblood that I need to serve people and make this a reality, then by all means, go and take it. But if it's something you want to do because you think it's going to fix your life's problems, you're asking for a bevy of new problems and it won't solve any of your existing ones. It'll just exacerbate them. Your relationships will fall apart. If they're not doing great, your money will dry up your mental health will start to deteriorate. It's only if it's the inverse that this is the only thing that you can get through. You're going to go through a world of hurt to hopefully come out more whole. And that's the point of the book. And if anyone wants to reach out to me, uh, I made a website called unslicedbook.com. It's got links to my LinkedIn, my Instagram, all the socials, including the Spotify playlist. Additionally, it also has a contact form if you ever wanted to reach out to me for a question or any public speaking or anything that I do, you can reach out on that website. That's terrific. And um, one of your articles is on Franchise Moneymaker this month as a featured post. So I urge everyone to go to Franchise Moneymaker, read that. There's a link back uh, to the site. Once again, the book is called Unsliced. And Mike Bausch, um, just this has been fascinating. You've been a great guest. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I truly, truly appreciate it. All right. Great to meet you. And maybe we'll have a slice one day. We, perhaps we will. <laughs>